all my, all my new Cata fam in the building, all my online Cata fam, all my Cata fam that has been here a while, I want to remind you what our vision statement is. It's not really a statement. It's actually just one word. Move. Move. Say it with me right now. Say move. move. Tell the person next to you, say move. move. We got the sign up. We got our old school sign up. Move. Say it one more time. Say move. move. If I had one word to summarize the will of God for every one of us, it is that. Say it with me. Move. Move. And I'm going to be honest with you. It's been a long while since I've taught on it. And TBH, keep it 100. It's been too long. And I'm sorry. It's actually deepened in my own heart and in my own spirit. And I chose to do it on a holiday weekend to speak to the people who were in town and want to be here and the people online that are out of town but want to, want to, uh, want to um, hear the heart and vision of this church. Say it one more time. Say move. 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 That is the will of God for your life. And I want to speak about it today because God has really just given me a renewed passion. God has been moving. God is still moving and he will always be moving. And I'm about to pour my heart out to you for the remaining time we have left. I'm going to pour my heart out to you because I want you to know this. It's your move. It's your move. Tell somebody like you at least want to grow in this. Tell us, say, it's your move. It's your move. It's your move. The will of God is for you to move. God is moving. It is your move. And the reason I say if you haven't shared the video, Catafam, in person, online, if you believe in this place, share it because this is not just a title of a message. This is not just the theme for today. This is not just a catchy phrase, move. This is the heart and the vision that this church was built on because we believe if you will move, even if you move in the wrong direction, if you do it for the right motives and heart, the will of God is for you to move. Tell somebody it's your move. It's your move. There's most of the things you miss out on in life is because you're not moving. God's always moving. He promises he is. And if you don't think it, it's because you're not moving. You don't feel it, it's because you're not moving. God is always moving. He's always working. And if you haven't already shared the video, it's your move. Tell somebody one more time. I'm going to say it a lot, actually. Tell them, say, it's your move. Before, you, before we end today, you're going to say it with authority. Whether you like it or not, you're going to know it's true. Say it one more time. Say, it's your move. Now tell the person next to you, say, Move! Move. We have gotten stuck in a season, and it happens in a lot of seasons, but COVID's really done it to us, and I can't believe that I haven't preached on the vision of this church more because the will of God for your life is to move. And it is your move. There's been seasons in the last year, seasons of the last year, because let's face it, COVID feels like 10 seasons, that God is, hey, hey, what, what, hey get up there on that, pre- move. It don't just sound good. Move. Tell somebody, it's your move. It's your move. It's your move. And moving looks different season to season, situation to situation, and person to person. And we're going to see it. We're going to see it. Moving may look different, but tell somebody it's your move. It's your move. Can we just jump into Scripture? I just want to jump right in it. Y'all ready? I want to take you to Exodus chapter 14. And it's actually an incredible story. Uh, Moses is, at, is leading Israel out of Egypt, okay? It's a remarkable story that I'm really not going to cover the details, but here's the thing. Israel was in Egypt for 400 years. 400 years. Most of those were as slaves, as slaves. And it's a crazy story how God led Moses, called Moses, and he led them out of, of, of Egypt. And they are coming out of Egypt. God wanted them to build a... God wanted them to have their own space, to build their own life, to pursue the promise of God and experience the presence and peace of God at their own pace on their own terms. And they had wasted 400 years in Egypt being enslaved. And I want you to know throughout the Bible, this isn't just one story. It's the story I chose to, I could preach it through a ton of them. God wants that for you. The gospel is truly what Bradford said, Emmanuel, God with you. The presence of God is right here with you. And God God wants you to be close to him. God wants to be connected with you. God wants to do life with you. The, The reason Christianity is so unique and so different is because we serve a personal God who came down to our level because he loves us and he made us and he invested. God wants that for you. It wasn't just Israel. Tell somebody it's for you. It's for you. God wants to be close to you. And I don't know, maybe you got off your path. 
Maybe it's been, maybe you felt close to God and you felt committed to God at one time in your life, but you can't get it back and you don't know how. The same was for Israel. God wasn't leading Israel back to their promised land. He was taking them back. 400 years. The gospel is whether you got off your path or whether you've never found your path, God wants to take you to it and he's got some things he wants to do. Tell somebody it's your move. It's your move. And I'm going to prove it. I can prove it throughout the Bible, but I'm just taking one story. So what happens is Israel, they, Moses and God moved and Israel is heading out of Egypt. They're heading, they're making strides, heading in the right direction. And the, the, the scripture says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh was basically the king or ruler of Egypt, which was the most powerful nation in the known world in that time. And he got pissed off because he let them go, but he decided to pursue them. So he got all his chariots, his huge army, and he began to chase them down and he caught up to him. He caught up to them. And they're terrified. Could you imagine? They're terrified. They thought they were about to walk in freedom. And look, just like Bradford says, you plan things and all hell breaks loose. They're terrified. Terrified. So we're going to pick up in verse 10. Tell somebody I'm ready to grow. I'm ready to go. Tell somebody it's your move to grow. We're going to see that too. Starting in verse 10. Caught you up. Here we go. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here in the wilderness? Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? They were saying, Look, we've already been through so much, Moses. You ever done that in your life? You ever been so heavy? God, I've been through enough. I can't even breathe. This season, this season seems like a lifetime. You ever told your kids, we've been through enough. You're making this harder. Why are you doing this right now? Right. Told your spouse, I can't, why are you acting like this? Right. Right. I can't even get on the same page. We've been through enough. You ever cried like you just can't even breathe? You're like, man, when is, it gonna, when is there going to be some normalcy? I don't want to be complacent. I just want to feel normal. I want to feel like I'm human. And they got a shot and they get cornered and they realize they're about to die. And they say, Moses, uh, there was enough. We could have died in Egypt like the last however many generations, 400 centuries of our people. We could have died there and not died here. Why did you do this, Moses? Why have you done this to us? Why did you leave us? Why did you leave us? Excuse me. Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? They told him, we don't want to do this. We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. I'm going to stop right there because we do this all the time. I want, you to, I want, you to, I want to relate this to your life. Huh. They would rather... They didn't want to risk dying to live. They would rather not die in Egypt. They weren't willing to risk it. They didn't want to risk dying to actually live. They wanted to just exist and stay in Egypt. They didn't want to risk it. And we think that's crazy. Like looking like you have a chance to, you have a chance to live in a promised land and actually have freedom that you've never, your, your, your generations hadn't experienced. And they're like, no, 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 but we don't want to risk dying. We don't want to take any more risks. We're so tired and traumatized that we would rather just function dysfunctionally in Egypt than to actually live in the promised land. And we don't want to die in the process, Moses. Don't you dare. You do it all the time. Life has a way of doing that to you. Life will make you just stop taking risks, stop making steps, stop actually thinking that there's hope, stop actually pursuing the promise of God. There are people that come to church their entire lives and they worship or they, they act like they're pursuing God. They say all the right things, know the Bible. They stopped pursuing God years ago because trauma said, I'm stopping taking risks because disappointment stopped me in my tracks and I would rather not risk it than the risk getting hurt again. 
I would rather I would rather be in default mode, stay at my house and eat ramen noodles than go out and live and get my heart broken again. I would rather not have another conversation with my spouse because we are so angry at each other and I would rather just co-inhabit and one day look over their grave or have an ugly divorce because we never truly fought it out in a way that we could move forward or call it quits. We look at this and we're like, that's just ridiculous until you look at your story. They were like, I'm not going to risk it. Take me back to what I'm used to. We get pissed off at God when he takes us in a season and stretches us and changes things up. I want to go back to the way it used to be. I want to go back to when my family was small, when life was simple. Man, no matter how complicated life gets, the gospel is very simple. And you get away from the simplicity of the love of God, that's when you're confused. The love of God is simple. And Moses is saying, they're stuck. They're stuck. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord, here's the famous line, the scripture that we stop here. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. I'm going to stop right there for a second at verse 14. I'll come back in a minute, baby. I'm going to tell you, we stop right there. I don't know how many years I quoted that verse and stopped there. I quoted the NIV, I think. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. We stop there. We love stopping there to say, God will fight for me. We stop there. And if you, these people are panicked. Israel is panicked. They're pitiful, pointed fingers, pitching fits. You've been in those seasons. We look, adults look just like children. We're playgrounders. It don't change. Go to social media. You'll see an elementary school playground altogether. <laughs> Go to your text when you're cussing people out that you don't like. Playground! You just don't get, sense of, you don't get sense of the principal, principal's office. You just ruin your life and relationships. Moses said, uh-uh, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still, stay calm. And we stop there. That's the problem. We stop there. And that is only half. We read this. We read this like a meme, like a tweet, like a post, like this is a one-liner, like this is a quote. This is a part of a much larger story. And if you only apply that principle, you're only applying a little bit of the, a little bit of the principle, half the principle at best, and you're going to only get half the promise. But really, you're just going to miss it all. That's what we do. The Lord will fight for me. The Lord will fight for me. You need only to be still. And if you want to apply half the gospel, man, I'm sorry, but you're just going to be like Israel sitting there. When is life going to happen? It's right in front of you if you'll look at it. Because that's a beautiful verse, but it is half the principle. And I want to continue reading because the Bible is a big story and you can abuse it. People abuse it more when they only read parts of it. And this verse has been quoted thousands of times, thousands of, thousands of times. It's almost like God knew it. Because we're about to pick up the next verse. Y'all ready to tell somebody next verse? A lot of times we don't like going to the next verse. That was good enough. <laughs> the tweets and the posts and the encouraging. We like to stop. The, that was a good enough verse. Huh. Then the Lord said to Moses, why? Are, Moses, he was positive. He wasn't, he wasn't griping. He was saying, y'all calm down. God's got this. Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get, say it with me. You better say it like you mean it. Tell the people to quit or get. Tell the, tell the people to get moving. Y'all getting me excited. Y'all gonna make y'all trying to, I'm gonna have to get y'all excited. <laughs> Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground, and I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops and his chariots and his charioteers. I'm going to take down everything he's throwing at you. And you were going to see when you move, I'm moving. And when you move, that is the formula. Tell somebody, it's your move. It is your move. It's funny because God follows that verse. It's almost like God knew. Uh, Moses, that's a pre that sounds pretty. And it's true. And they're going to be quoting you for thou thousands of years. And we still are. Lord, I fight for you. You need only, be only to be still. It's, it's beautiful, but here's what moving looks like in this situation. Here's what it looks like to do what you're, uh, what you're talking about. 
Moses, here's what it looks like to be still and let me fight for you. Move. <laughs> Move. He says, absolutely, I'm going to fight for you. Be still. Move. <laughs> Move. Don't misread it. Move. Go to verse 15. Move. You're stuck in a chapter of your life. Turn the page. Ugly divorce, turn the page. Don't get remarried too quickly. Why don't you seek God since you lost 20 years in a bad marriage and never were able to figure yourself out? Whatever it looks like, turn the page. God is always moving. It's your move. We like to stop at verse 14, but we play a part. <laughs> Moses says, or God says, Moses, you move. Tell Israel to move. What's in your hand, pick up your staff over the sea. Then you'll see what I can do. And that day, Moses moved. Israelites moved. God moved. And the Red Sea moved. Tell somebody move. It is your move, and it looks different season to season, and you got to have wisdom. But first, we've got to unteach some principles that are incomplete. Because if you don't, if you don't apply the, if the, if you apply incomplete principles in your life, your life is going to be incomplete. So if you say you bank your life on the gospel, by God, it better be complete. Because if you if you apply incomplete principles because it's convenient, you're going to live a life that is incomplete. Why do we have a world full of people that are so hungry and starving and love is right in front of them? Why do we have so many people that God has blessed them with a beautiful spouse, a beautiful kid, a beautiful family, a wonderful life, and they go home and they're as empty as all get out because it is the principles and the things that they believe in their life are incomplete. It's your move. It's your move. And that was what this church we feel like complacency has killed so many of our joy, so much of our joy. We live in hell. Won't scare anybody. You ain't gonna scare anybody. You live in hell until you decide that you're gonna apply the principles. It sounds good, right? Move, Moses. Move, move, move. So the Bible says to be still a lot. So I know I got some people that know enough of the Bible. What about this? I'll just name a few. There's a lot more where this came from. Be still and know that I'm God, right? Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act, right? Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, right? It's all over. I could, go, I could go on and on, but you get the point. Well, here's the thing that we see here and we see throughout the Bible that makes it a whole complete promise from God that you have to apply. Here's the thing. Being still isn't doing nothing. Being still isn't being lazy. Being still isn't being idle because Jesus said that we will be held accountable for every idle work. So if these principles say being still is doing nothing, see, don't, you're waiting on God. Don't, waiting isn't wandering. Waiting isn't pushing the people away in your life that love you and are actually wanting you. When you're waiting on God, when, you, when you're waiting, you better invest in what you're believing God for. You better serve the heart and vision and the blessing that you're praying for. Waiting isn't doing nothing. Waiting is moving. I'm going to tell you something. I didn't wake my, waste my single years just begging God for a wife. Matter of fact, that's the reason that I never prayed for one. Because waiting isn't wandering. Because when you don't, when you are, when you're, when you're waiting and doing nothing, that ain't waiting. That is waiting on disaster. Because you're gonna find somebody you ain't gonna be able to appreciate them. Waiting isn't wandering. Invest in the. You got an entrepreneurial mindset, boy. Waiting isn't doing nothing. You better be generous now. Don't wait to all these people talk about. Man, if I won the lottery, I'd pay this church off. Why don't you invest in it now? What you have? You're praying, God. Why don't you invest in the things you believe in? Why don't you invest in things that actually? when your kids need from you instead of competing with everybody else in, your, in their schools. I'm telling you, we've got this mindset that peace is doing nothing, that the peace of God is just being passive. Being, that's just laziness. You sit at home, well, I, just, I got nothing to prove. Yeah, but you, as Steph Curry said, I got a lot to accomplish. I got a God who loves me and put gifts and abilities inside of me and he's moving and I am move into we've lost it we've lost the most of the principles move 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 
Joshua, y'all, he's sincere. Like, because here's the thing. You can pray all you want to. I believe the Bible talks about the prayer closet. I pray. That's why I get up early in the morning. It's usually first to pray and see God and second to work on my sermon for all y'all start calling me and texting me and Facebook messaging me, the people that don't have my number. And I love it, but I got to get up. I got to beat you to the punch. But at some point, you got to come out of the prayer closet because when you don't come out of the prayer closet and start practicing what you're praying for, prayer has become a cop out. That is not moving. You can go through the motions and call it moving, but it ain't moving and you're going to miss out because it ain't moving. I got so many people, they got to make a big decision in their life. They're like, I'm just going to pray about it. Well, three years later, I'm still praying about it. When, when there's holes in a boat, you either patch the holes or it's going down. And God is literally saying, Moses, that sounds good and it's true. Here's what it looks like. Get your boys and move and get what I put in your hand. Put it over the sea. You're going to see the great. Two million people that day saw the greatest miracle in the, in the Bible. You know why? They all moved. God moved. The Red Sea moved. And we're sitting here begging God to win the lottery. And, and everything in our life, we're broke. We're, we're poverty stricken. And it's not because you're pitiful. And I'm not talking about just financially. I'm talking about a lot of areas of your life because you haven't practiced the things that you're praying and believing God for. Be still means pursue him. You can control a lot more of your life than you want to admit. And until you control it, you're, how are, what we do is when we try to control God's part. And then we say, I'm being still about the things that God's saying. You need to handle that. You need to go talk to your friend who's, who's crossing your boundaries. You need to go talk to that person, that employee who's not doing their job. That's how we roll. Be still. No, 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 no. Joshua, in Joshua 7, he was struggling with God. Like, he was in a situation. He started fighting. For the first time in years, Josh, Joshua took the Israelites to pursue the promised land because they wasted years after they got freed from Israel, from Egypt. And he's, he, they lost a battle, and that was a big deal. They could have all, everybody could have started fighting them because they didn't think they were strong. It was bad. And he's seeking, he's on his face seeking and sincerely struggling and seeking the Lord for guidance. Not a cop out. God, what do we do? He's crying out. You know what God said to him? He said, why are you on your face, Joshua? Rise up, move. He says, now it's not the time to be praying. Now's the time to be practicing. But what we do is when we love Jesus, we're like cop out prayer. Listen to me. Move. I could do it throughout the entire Bible. Move. The promises of God, we love to say them. Delight yourself in the Lord and then you will get the desires of your heart. I could name promise after promise. The love and God, the love and grace of God is the love of God is unconditional. The promises of God, you got a part to play. Tell somebody it's your move. And what's missing in your life is your move. See, the things we miss, if you're missing something in your life, it's because you're not making moves. Or you're making the wrong moves. You're making moves in areas that don't matter that much, and you're missing the things that do matter. Or you're making the right moves for the wrong motives. You know, I got a lot of people in this world. I've met them and I don't like to talk to them anymore. They know the Bible a lot more than they know God. Because you can read the Bible as a textbook and explain your way out of every next step that God's given you. And you can get a scripture and you can claim everybody else is cherry picking. But when you are not making a move that God is calling you to make and you're missing out, you may know the, you may quote KJV better than me. But the question is, are you moving? Are you moving? Because I'm telling you, move is what God, the American church, we are the most complacent church in the history of the body of Christ because we are the most privileged of them all. We don't know what persecution is, so we don't even, we're like, oh, I'm good. No, God says move. Because you can be spoiled by our culture and the, and the, and the privileged country we live in that blesses us, but you're going to miss out on what God offers because you never really move because when you have more resources, you can make more excuses. Move. Move. So for the rest of this message, I want you to see what this looks like for you. So I'm going to point to you, and you're going to say I'm making moves. You got me? Here we go. Online, if one of these applications speak to you, I want you to drop a comment. Say, making moves, Ben, or making, move, cat, making moves, Catalyst, because we're growing together. Whether you're watching this live or later, we're making moves. Say it with me. And we're not just making random moves. We are going to seek God and we are going to make moves for the right motives with the right heart. And even if we make the wrong moves, God honors it because that is what grace looks like. Grace is an unearned gift. 
Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. You can make the, the love, grace, and mercy of God, you can make a terrible decision and make it for the right motives, and God will make that wrong decision and put you on the path. So whether you got off your path or you've never really found your path, here's the gospel. You can make moves because what's missing in your life is your, your move. Your move. Here we go. You need a better job? You need a better job? Let me tell you something. You don't get a better job talking about getting a better job. You get, on, you get a LinkedIn account. You put in resumes. You update your resume. You actually spend time on your resume, and then you put out applications, period. You want a job? You don't get a better job talking about getting a better job. People are like, well, I'm just praying for it. I'm going to tell you. Very few opportunities that come from God are going to fall in your lap. You know how you get opportunities to pray about and options to pray about? Putting yourself out there for them. You worked a job for 40 years, and the last 25 of them, you've been saying, I just need a better job. You know why you don't have a job to pray about? Man, should I? It's, man, I love the problems when there's three doors, and I don't know which one to open. And some of you are like, I don't even know. I've been praying for a door to open if you stood in front of it. Right. Say it like you mean it. Make moves. Make moves. Here it is. Guys, uh, look, you like her? Like her? Why don't you say, hey? I'm talking to myself 10 years ago. Why don't you say, hey? Why don't you, you're ready to dance? Go ask her to dance. Man, I wish I'd have took my daddy's advice in junior high. Go ask them to dance. If they say no in your head, tell them they just missed the opportunity to dance with a bonner. That's on them. Right. Ask them to dance. Say, hey. Say, hey. All my feminists in the building, you better practice what you preach. This ain't the 1920s. This is the 2020s. You like him? You go say, hey. You go say, go, don't just say dance with me. Give him, give him the digits. <laughs> don't they, all my feminine, it's time. You don't get to have your cake and eat it too. You, you go ask them, say something. Baby, I am so thankful you made moves and gave hints because I was scared. <laughs> I was scared. And married to you, being with you almost seven years later, I'm still intimidated. When you look at me, I'm stepping back. Because she is everything that I was intimidated by. And she made moves and hints and everything. And finally, I realized, okay, thank you. I, was, I needed empowerment. Sometimes you need some empowerment in your life. And I ain't just talking about dating. I'm talking about just in general. This is what I'm preaching about right now. I'm trying to give you some empowerment to make a move. That's what's missing. Your move. God's move's not missing. Your move's missing. Your move's missing. Man. Make a move in your marriage. My God. Make a move in your marriage. If it's worth saving, make a, my God, make a move. Start talking. Start, commu start communicating about the small things. You don't text about when to take the kids, so-and-so. Start doing that. My God, start talking. Communicate. Apologize for the years that you've been closed out and you lost your closeness. It is so tragic to see couples build beautiful lives and beautiful families but lose their closeness because of busyness doing the life that they committed to do together. What's the point in building a beautiful life and not even knowing the person that you built it with? Talk. Share your insecurities. Bear your heart. My God, if you're afraid of being hurt, then you need to be single. Because you don't really, you can't be vulnerable. If you, to be able to experience love, you've got to risk being hurt, and you're going to get hurt before you experience the people that are supposed to be at your table. And you're going to have security because you're going to bear your heart. Bear your heart. Tell them the pressures that you put on yourself because of life. Men, tell them the pressure that you put on yourself to provide and how when you get an income decrease or when you lose your job. Tell them how, tell them. Tell them. And if they leave you, they're not supposed to be with you. Tell them. Tell them. Tell them what hurts you because they need to know what hurts you so that they don't do it. They need to know where you're sensitive. All my people that are old enough, I'm about to sing. Y'all ready? Oh my, this is R&B back in the day. Here we go. I want to know what makes you cry. Can you finish it with me? Here we go, here we go. So I can be the one who always make you smile. That's how you do it. 
tell them if if so, if, if you're living with somebody, if you're going, if you're go, if you're a friend with somebody, if you got family that they know your heart and insecurities and your wounds, and they keep stomping on them and crapping on them, that's a good thing you need to know. Walk away. But my God, share your heart. How are you ever going to be human when nobody really knows you? Amen. Knows you for you and what you've been through. And you've got to get hurt, man. You've got to get hurt sometimes before you find it. Trust me on that. Yes, Randall, that is true. Say it with me. No, make move. I'm making move. Here we go. Oh, yeah. One more thing. Most affairs, I'm just, I just got to pop off one more thing. Then I'm done with marriage. Most affairs have, or have nothing to do with somebody stepping up, uh, getting some on the side. It's way deeper than that. It's way deeper than that. It is people who are closed out and have been closed out, and that's all they know how to be. And usually it's a pattern because that's why once, it's not that once a cheater is always a cheater. If, that it, if, a, if somebody who cheats doesn't truly open their hearts for healing, they're never going to heal. They're not bad, they're broken. Don't talk to the person who you go to bed next to. Don't ever stop, don't ever stop investing in the relationship. And you need to have some hard conversations if, if the other one, or you stop investing or they stop investing, don't stop investing. Because I've learned that you're gonna fight battles, you're gonna build a life. But if you ever leave things that need to be talked about to the interpretation of your significant other's insecurities, it's not gonna end well. It doesn't even have to be your fault. It's not gonna end well. And you're gonna spend so many years in trauma when you could have just moved. Say it with me. Don't act, don't act. I know a lot of people have been through this. Don't act, don't act shy. Say it with me. Make moves. Make moves. What you do, you spend the rest of your life pushing good people away. Move. 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 Money problems. Oh, my God. Um, we were like, oh, I'm a problem. I need more money, God. Pray. Pray that I can get called up. Pray for more money. You want, you want another answer to how to move with that? Manage what you got first. Manage the money you got first. You've had a lot of seasons with different amounts of money. Manage what you got. You know what Jesus, you know what Jesus said? He said, those who are faithful in the little things will be given more. Why don't you quit begging God for more money and start managing what you got and little by little he'll give you more. And even if you're behind on what you make, he will fill in the gaps when he sees your faithfulness because he's moving. Make a move. Say it with me. Say it's your move. You ready? Move. Say it with me. Your move. Here we go. Here we go. It's your move to pray with your kids. Huh. It's your move. Men, women, Pray with your kids. How in the world are they ever going to be comfortable communicating with their creator and it not feel awkward unless they see their parents praying and it being smooth and just open and praying with them? Man, our kids, every one of them, Sarah's just shy. She can pray. You know how, why she can pray? Because she's heard. They have, Connor and Jacob, they've heard. Communication with their creator is normal to them, not, not, not awkward. How do you expect it when you don't even, your kids never even heard you pray over their life, pray over their school, you pray over their day at school. Pray to protect them. We pray for Garrett. His, his name before I adopted him was Ray. So we say, let him be a ray of sunshine so that people cannot even, so even if they don't know their experience in the love of Jesus, that's what they feel. Have to be eloquent. I'm not eloquent. I'm telling you, if there's one thing about my preaching, it's not as eloquent. Sincerity is what your kids need. Online, you better be dropping comments right now. It's your move to help around your, the house so that your spouse doesn't feel like your steward. You're like, that's so small. That's so small. No, it's not. The small things are where your marriage lives, thrives, or dies. When, when King Solomon said two are better than one, he wasn't talking about the number two. He was talking about teamwork. Right. You know what's worse? It's two people where one person does too much of the work. That's just hell. You might as well stay single. Small things. A marriage isn't built on Channing Tatum abs. 
It's not built on this figure that is fake and, and cost a bunch of money. Marriage is built on the small things. You fall in love a thousand little things and out of love. That's why I can tell you I wouldn't be intimidated. I say this, Angie. Angie, we got we dated. We asked these questions. She she said I love some Channing Tatum. I wouldn't be intimidated if that man walked in here because he looks good, but he don't know how to love her like I do. Oh, he's eye candy. But I, as long as I stay on my game, Channing ain't got nothing to it. Oh, he's got the, he's got the exterior. Why don't you why don't you do something? Why don't, you actually, why don't you actually try on the small things and quit trying to make a million dollars so your family's out of debt? No, just, just, just try. It's time to grow closer to God, and that is your move. Your move. Hey, heard so many people talking about, by the way, I see a couple people coming back to church. Catafam, I am thankful because I've gotten to the place that I realized there's a lot of people ain't coming back, uh, that we're going to come back. And guess what? We're going to still grow and reach more people regardless because God moves and we just have to. Move. Two months in the quarantine. If you ain't growing closer to God, it ain't God, it's you. Two months in the quarantine, everybody's praying about, I miss my people, I miss my church. I miss my church. I miss it so much. Oh, we were crying when we came back together, half of us. Now we're over a year in and we can actually be human again. And people are acting, one, they're afraid to be human again. Or two, they don't even know how to be human again. That year, I have never experienced such heartbreak as a pastor. Because there were people that came out of the holes, the darkness. Lives were changing in here. And I got calls from them saying how darkness, uh, the darkness they were in. You know where the darkness comes from? Disconnect. You know where disconnect comes from? Not showing up in life. Quarantine happened. But you better be human again. And if you aren't, disconnect, darkness comes from disconnect. And that is on you, not God. Hey. Online, if you don't want to come back to Catalyst, go somewhere, connect, because you are not going to be human and feel the presence of God the way he called you to. You may not like people. You may not need as many people as me, but you need people because God says so. And at some point, you got to quit crying about the darkness. you got to make moves towards the light because you can be human again. You just got to make moves. Come to church. If you miss church, come to church. Gosh. Lastly, I'm almost, I'm, I swear I'm getting there. I told everybody I was going to be a shorter message today, but then I get riled up. Ah! I get a lively crowd on Memorial Day. Good night. I, I'm getting out of here soon, I promise. Here we go. If this is the only spiritual investment you make in yourself in the week, it ain't going to work and it ain't going to end well. We are a family that grows together. It starts, we start the conversation on Sunday. You better carry it on every day or you, you're going to end up empty. You're going to be like, man, he just don't do it for me anymore. You're going, me? me? Ben? Have you heard me? Have you looked at me? No. I start the conversation. This worship band, this church family, every team from vacuuming the floors to June 12th. Say it with me. Say June 12th. June 12th. We start the conversation. If you're not growing spiritually, that's on you. I pour my heart into preaching a message every week, and the people who, who stand on this platform do too. But we don't have what it takes to give you what you can only give yourself. We can start it. But you better pick up your Bible or you're going to be reading Exodus 14, 14 like a tweet because you don't ever open your Bible. Man. So this is what we're going to do as a church. And if you want to grow... You ain't got no excuses. Tell somebody no excuses. Matter of fact, that's our, that's, our, like, that's our thing next week. It's not on this, but it's our like. Share the video because you got no excuses. Side to side, I'm going to leave you without them. <laughs> We're going to have a summer reading challenge. Some of you have already uh, liked the Facebook page. Tara has done an incredible job of uh, having this page for the people that want to grow. We're trying to invite people that we know of to get it out there so that we can have it. We're going to get a schedule. We're going to read the Gospels this summer. You want to grow? Here it is. You're like, I don't have money for a Bible. You don't have to. You version. Can we put that up there? This is what the app looks like. It's free. I don't care. I don't even use my paperbacks anymore. You know why? I got like 75 million translations on my U version. Audible. You're like, man, I just like to listen. Audible. I like to listen to. I'm one of the 10% of the weirdos in the world. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a listener. I listen. 
You have to pay $70 for a drama test. It's right there. You can read about two chapters a day. We're going to break it up, and starting June 13th, Tara and Terry are going to work on it. We're going to put a plan out there where you know every week what you need to read. You can read it with yourself, your spouse, or your family. It doesn't matter. You can listen to it, read it. You can do what you want to with it. But I'm going to tell you, you better do it. If you want to grow, that's what you do. Tell somebody, make moves. Make moves. Because the Gospels are just the life of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. People are like, man, it's a lot to read the Bible from start to finish. Why don't you just start with Jesus? Because he's the point of it all anyway. Amen. Start somewhere. Two chapters a day. I got people all the time, I just don't know much of the Bible. I don't know how to, I don't know how to teach it to my kids. You don't have to. version. can we put that back up there one more time, baby? Here's the thing about version. They have ridiculous amounts of devotionals from the leading church leaders in our world, free. Angie and I have done them together. They're anywhere from four to five-day devotionals to 30, whatever. We've done it with our kids. We did it with Sarah when she was 15 or 16 before she went to bed. We read one. We do it for your marriage. They got everything for every type of life you can, life um, difficulty you're dealing with. You don't have to know the Bible. I just took away your excuses. All you got to do is read. And if you can't read, they got audible ones that all you got to do is click the video and show your kids. <laughs> you want to grow? You can grow. God's moving. It's your move. It's your move. It's your move. So this summer, man, summer's going to be fun, but we're still going to grow. When you're not beaching it up, we're going to be here. We're going to be here. When you're in town, we're going to be here. If you're on the beach right now, I'm going to tell you right now, there is nothing that stops you from watching this. If you can't watch it, you can share it with somebody who can. Because I don't want people to just hear the message that is preached here. I want them to do something with it. Because I don't want, hear, I don't want hearers of the word. I want doers because doers make moves. And when you make moves, that's when you capitalize on what God has put in front of you and wants to do in your life. Move. 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 We're going to grow. Matter of fact, this summer, we don't even have a series. One word I talked to Connor about, kind of what I wanted to preach on throughout the summer, and we came up with a word. Here it is, locked in. You're going to see it everywhere this summer. It's not a series. It's not a certain theme. Uh, honestly, in my life, the times in my life where I needed to grow the most, the times in my life where things were going good, but I needed to stay focused and not get complacent, the times in my life where my heart was broken, my ticks were going crazy, I say one word to describe how I've always tried to keep my head down and focused on what's in front of me, not what's around me. I'm locked in. And this summer, we are going to be locked in as a church. When you're in town, come on to church. Let's grow together. If you're online, you can still watch it if you got a minute. If you're not, share the video so we can reach other people. Tell somebody it's your move. And I'm going to finish on this. You don't, um, a lot of people don't even know where to start. They're like, man, this last year of COVID, it's got me off guard. Or you're like, my whole life's throwing me off. You don't even know where to start, don't know what to do. Let me remind you. Israel spent 400 years away from their path and their promise. So you have no excuse. So I'm going I'm 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 to give you kind of some handles. Here's what you do. I don't know where to start. God reminded Moses, okay? He said, tell the people of Israel to move, and you lift up your hand and your staff. That's really interesting because when God was calling Moses, when he was calling Moses to go to Egypt and free his people, two million Israelites, and he was making excuses, he was scared, right? Over and over, I stutter. He got all these things. God, and finally, you know what God said? God said, what's in your hand? All this moment, these years, late, these years later where he's freeing the Egypts, he says, hey, lift up what's in your hand because Moses wasn't making excuses anymore. He had seen him. He says, he reminds him, raise up your hand. What's in your hand? See, the staff that was in his hand wasn't just a staff. It could, we, we see in scripture it could turn from a snake and back into a staff. When they were in the wilderness and um, they, were, uh, they were thirsting to death, he, the staff tapped a rock and made water flow from it and the staff parted the Red Sea. See, God says, God says, Moses, here's the thing. You're making excuses. What's in your hand? The gospel is God has put something in every one of your hands. You may not believe it, but it's there. God put something in Moses' hands that when he needed it, he had what he needed. And he had no excuses to He needed to use it. He's done the same for you. What's in your hand? God has put some abilities and gifts in your hand and in your heart. Not just one. You're not defined by one gift. I'm not defined by preaching. I can do a lot more. This is just where I love to, what I love to invest in the most. What's on your heart? What's in your hand? What are the passions? He's done it. Your SAT scores may be low, but your people skills are through the roof. 
What's in your hand? What's on your heart? Man, you may, you may not like people. You may not like school, but you don't do well with people, but you're creative. Man, my wife has anxiety. She don't want to ever be seen as a cheerleader. She loves people, but she don't want to be out here being a fixture. She's back there in the tech team. That's her heart. She loves people, but she don't like to ever be a fixture. She's creative. Maybe you, maybe you don't like people, but you have a strong back. You're a servant. You're a servant. You build things. You know, your ingenuity, man. You got ingenuity. You can fix problems, but they're problems not with people. You can build buildings, build houses, build skyscrapers. I'm going to tell you something about Jack Lenny. He, can't just, he don't just have abilities with his hands. He can do anything, and he can do it faster than anybody I've ever seen. In between jobs, that man will come here, and we got, you know, it's a big facility. You got rain. You got leaks. He will fix a leak in between job and jobs and have his guys do it with him and go to the next job. Jack is amazing. He jumps ladder to ladder, and I'm telling him, like don't you dare fall we need you God has given you some abilities he said Moses remember what's in your hand you don't know what to do you're like I don't even know what to do how to get started what's in your hand what's on your heart you have passions you have abilities listen to me you may not like adults you may love kids I don't understand you but God does and that's why he gave you the gifts that he didn't give me because I would oh. You may actually have great people skills, great people skills, but it's not to be a pastor. It's not to preach. You want to be in law enforcement. You want to be a politician. You want to be an advocate. You want to be a lawyer. You want to be a community leader. I don't know. You've got passions. You like social issues. You want to make the world more equal. You want to make America a better place than it's been. And that is your heart and passion. What is in your hand and on your heart? Start there. It doesn't matter how far off your path you've gotten. Israel spent 400 years and God still loved them enough to take them back to the promise. What's there? What's in it? Oh, all my retired and disabled people, I ain't done with you. You have no excuse either because you're a contributor. Agent and an excuse. I'm going to tell you something about Randall Petty. Randall Petty took an early retirement. His back's tore up from the military and everything. He took an early retirement. They took a pay cut, rebudgeted, decided we're not moving to the beach like we wanted. We're going to stay and do ministry because they came to Catalyst. They connected. The man goes to him and Heather go to Noonan. Every Tuesday, man, the joker retired a couple weeks ago. Man, I, I, I pull up in the morning. That man's spraying the, the grass is growing up in the parking lots. He's spraying killer. He's busting it, sweating. When I get time, I get to invest my heart in him. He just wants to grow. He's my dad's age, and he's retired, and he hurts like crazy. He can work with the best, and he loves people. You got no excuses. God is moving. Move or miss out. Move. Move. God is moving, and you will never get to see what he's trying to move you towards until you move. It's your move that you're missing. All my disabled people that are like, man, I can't even walk anymore. I can't even do this anymore. I can barely get out of my house. Well, let me tell you something. You still got something to offer and contribute. The Bible says a gray hair earned in righteousness is a crown of glory. And you're like, well, I didn't earn my gray hairs in righteousness. Yeah, but you learn. And when you learn by losing, it's a win. And there's some young people and you got family and you got a lot of wisdom that people need to hear so that you can save them from learning like you did. You got something. God's saying what's in your hand, what's on your heart. He's moving. It's your move. None of us have excuses. He's moving. God told Moses, move. Be, being still is moving. Being still is being faithful. Being still is saying, God, I'm pursuing you. When I don't feel you moving, I trust you're moving. And I'm going to move. And I'm going to bank my life on you. And I'm going to finish this message with, we had a distant family member. Uh on our um my um my the, the biological uh, well uncle larry how about that we're all families that didn't matter uncle larry and stacy um we love them they live in birmingham they have a uh, he has a sister-in-law stacy's sister who got colon cancer in her mid-40s she passed away a few weeks ago and we were praying for we were praying for healing uh, and she got it, just not what we were, the way we were praying for. She's got a family, I think two or three kids that are still very young. And it was awful. It was awful. And I got to just pray over the tragedy, but I really didn't know much about it until she passed. This woman with her last breath, with the strength she had left, she planned her funeral. She wrote letters. Matter of fact, she wrote a Facebook post for when she took her last breath. And I want to tell you that you can move even when it doesn't make sense. You can move because you 
you can trust God with the things that you don't know, like eternity. You can trust him. She wrote this. Got posted when she took her last breath. breath. Dear family, friends, co-workers, and acquaintances, God, I hope... If this, if you ever see that I'm gone, you better know that this is the way I felt. Thank you so much for all the love, text, emails, monetary gifts, gift cards, hotel donations, and especially prayers during my illness on earth. This woman died with gratitude. Her kids, she would miss so much. She's in her early early to mid 40s. She dies grateful. If you look around, you got something to be grateful for. She said, I was so blessed and humbled to have so many praying for me. Please know this is a woman that she has to face the fact that her healing's happening in eternity. She said, please know that your prayers were answered. For I am healed completely in heaven. God is good and I pray that I helped you draw nearer to him. I look forward to reuniting with you one day with love. Julie, you have no idea the impact that your faith has. Angie shared that with me when I was, we were riding to church a couple weeks ago. She didn't even let cancer rob her of her faith. I promise you her kids felt that. They may gravitate away towards anger in seasons, but they felt that. That legacy is so rich and it will impact eternity, not just here. And we don't even under, she didn't even understand it. And she was moving to her last breath and she had plans for the people she loved after. She moved in the things that she could control because she trusted God with the things she couldn't. And she trusted to her last breath that life is bigger than this life and God's love is bigger. And that was how she lived and how she died. And that's why King David in Psalm 23 can say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because he would live like that. That's why he could die like that. That's what we're missing. Your move, not his. Will you bow your heads with me? I don't know what you need to make moves towards today. I'm sure every one of us needs some type of healing. It's your move. God is moving. I don't know if you need healing from disappointment, from bitterness, from hatred, from anger. I don't know what it is. I don't know if you need to figure out how to live again and love again because you've gotten so far off your path. People hurt you. Life drove you crazy. You lost your faith. You lost your tenderness. You lost your gentleness. I don't know if you need to learn to manage your money better. I don't know if you need to learn to be human again. I don't know what you need online. I don't know what you need, but I'm going to tell you, every one of us, if we can lock into the love of Jesus, the love of Jesus will change you. It will change you and your situation will follow suit but you better let Jesus change you we're going to lock into that love because it may not make sense but we can move towards it because it is where the power of God comes from the presence of God that Bradford talked about one moment can change your life and it wants to change it the presence of God can change it every day every head bowed and eyes closed will you just pray this in your heart if you want this pray it say Jesus in your heart, as I say a lot, Jesus, I want it. I want to learn to love like you. I want to receive your love again. I want to learn to live in that love. Even if it's again or for a first time, I want it, Jesus. Thank you for thinking I'm worthy. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for not just dying for me, but for living for me. I give my life to that. I want to be locked in. In Jesus' name.